Good evening, I'm Emma Rose Smith, writer and editor, and I'm here tonight speaking with John Steiner, author of The Last Wilkies and Other Stories. I'm also speaking with Josh Dubrow, who's been working as John's editor for this collection. Can we start by talking about the short story itself and um, what it can do and what it can't do? And I, I find within your work um, quite a large difference between the, sh the short stories in the collection, but also between some of the more experimental works and, and more traditional plot-driven short stories. Do you think that there's certain things that the short story can do and, and can't do? I think it depends on what your definition of a short story is. If you've got, and I mean, I kind of eschew any definition of a short story. I'm sort of about breaking out of whatever conventions might exist and seeing you know, can you write something really weird but still make it readable and still make it work, still make characters that the reader cares about? Or even if you make characters the reader doesn't care about, then at least, you know, write something that will hold someone's interest for however long it is. Yeah. I think I'd say it's not so much a matter of what it won't do, what it can't do, but maybe what other things it does better than long fiction and what other things it doesn't do quite as well as long fiction. Um, you know, and I suppose the earlier models of short stories were very plot driven even more than character driven. And I suppose with writers like Chekhov, you sort of had plot and character became very important. Um, and more contemporary short stories might focus on the, on the image. So I've had a lecturer who calls the short story or short fiction the lyric sister to poetry. So it can sometimes occupy a place between fiction and poetry, I think, maybe, um, where the meaning might just come through use of words, through repetition, through an image, through a symbol, that kind of thing. Um, it can probably do that a lot better than a novel because it's compressed. So would you say language then becomes more important in a short story? Than yes, a definitely. I think that in a thousand page book, you know, Fifty Shades of Grey, you can get away with things that you can't get away with in a short story. Yeah, I think so. It's a bit like the album that's got, you know, some killer, some filler. You can get away with that in a novel, you can't in a short story. But I think in the same way that poems once, you know, had to have this iambic structure, there was a lot of rules about poems and they kind of just became free. And I think, you know, like on that website McSweeney's, they have open letters, or lists, and are those short stories? Like, can a list be a short story? Could a shopping list be a short story if there was some kernel in there that, you know, said something? I think so, because I kind of, I loved short stories, and then I kind of got to this point where I felt like they all seemed more or less, you know, like, oh yes, that's the short story. I don't know, that, which sounds really flippant or something, but. And I kind of burned out on short stories for a while. And then, but then I think reading David Foster Wallace, much like the character in Poyumanon, that kind of rekindled this like, oh, wow, you can do, you know, like brief interviews with hideous men. He, there's like such amazing <laughs> stuff in that book. And such, you know, like, oh, wow. It was one of those moments where you're like, oh, I didn't realize you could do this. Oh, in that case, and so I kind of got back into it, but I would have an idea. And then I think like, you know, how can I approach this differently and kind of mess with it or, yeah, just break out of any conventional structure. Yeah. So John, the majority of your stories seem to come from the question, what if? A lot of them are just from either things I saw on the street or things I heard happening to people or things that happened to me. I would try to like synthesize and mix together various of those elements. Um, but some of them are f quite straight, like autobiographical, I guess, contract. It's quite autobiographical. Summit. So those kind of conventional stories are pretty autobiographical. And then, like you said, a lot of them was just sort of like, oh, that's a funny idea. I wonder if I could make a story out of that. The stories in the book were written over a fairly long period of time. Like some would go back as far as the mid-90s. And then some I just wrote in the last year. 
Was there a lot of editing needed to turn these stories into a book? The book was very different originally. So initially, I had published Poyumanon in one of Spineless Wonders anthologies, and then the publisher, Bronwyn Meehan, said, you know, do you have a lot of stories? Do you have enough to make a collection? And I said, I don't know, maybe. And so I sent her an assortment of stories, and she said she liked them, but it wasn't enough, quite enough for a book. So she said, you know, do you want to withdraw your submission and write some more? So I did, and then resubmitted it. So between that first and second submission, I cut a lot of stories, rewrote a lot of stories, and wrote some new stories. Is there a central theme throughout the book? I had to look for a commonality once I had just selected the collection. And what I realized was that everyone in the book is looking for where they belong. They're all sort of figuring out like who they are, where they fit into the world, whether it's the guy in contract who's looking for home but he's not sure where that is anymore, or whether it's Aaron and the last Wilkies who has to decide if she's a lion or a gazelle. And then I realized like that the last Wilkies was a good was a great sort of like anchor to the whole collection. And and she is forced to take action on that. Yeah, she really, she has she can't just be in denial. She has to sort of do that. Um, well, actually, I had said to John earlier, I did think of a lot of these stories as sort of postmodern Dubliners, that moment where people are faced with the crisis of action. And well, in Dubliners, you know, no one sort of responds to the crisis. And it turns out that all the idols have feet of clay, you know. I think the interesting thing in The Last Wilkies is that sometimes it maybe doesn't matter that much whether people take the positive action or sort of remain inert. Or like the way it is presented is sort of very subtle. And that point will often be the end or the twist in the plot of the story. So we don't really get to find out, you know, we don't sort of really get to find out how Erin goes on to feel about what happens after she decides to go in and shut down the Wilkies or how the couple feel if they get the house, you know, and they move in, do they feel awful? You know, are they haunted by what they've done? We, we sort of don't find that out. It's just that moment, like that tipping point, I guess. And that's really interesting that a lot of the stories sort of stop there for me. There is a definite lack of closure in a lot of the stories, yeah. I felt. Um, I don't know how deliberate that is on your part. Very deliberate. What have you got against closure? I think it's artificial somehow. Like when is there ever really closure? There's always some new question left unanswered. Mm. I think also I really, I'm drawn to those stories that just kind of like hit you with this like, <clears throat> and then end suddenly, mm. yeah. which is a total Raymond Carver kind of ending. And tell us about your involvement in the film world. Majored in film at uni and did some screenwriting. And then at UTS in the writing program did two screenwriting classes, which I really loved. So I think, yeah, that informs a lot of the, like sometimes I'll have an idea and I'll have to decide like, is, should this be a screenplay or should this be a story? Do you always know which one it is? So far. Are there commonalities writing for the screen and for the page? I think because when you're writing a screenplay, you can't say how someone feels. You have to show how they feel. So you can't say, you know, mm. Marvin was very nervous. You know, you have to say he picks up a glass of water and his hand trembles. Mm. So in a lot of the stories I think are fairly filmic, so to speak. But then, you know, things like Contract, which is more, you know, that Robert Drew-esque one, isn't at all, because it's just really like riding inside a character's head. Mm. But I th I'm probably more inclined to the script kind of feel. Maybe all fiction writers should do screenwriting, because you've um, certainly kind of nailed the golden rule of, you know, show, don't tell. Mm. There are no, like, wordy paragraphs of exposition setting stuff up, so um, maybe it really helps having that training. I mean, it's a good way to, to have economy. Yeah. You know, if you're writing a novel, then you can take a five pages to describe exactly what type of chiffonier yeah. Sally has in her bedroom and what she thinks about as she looks out the window, whereas yeah, if you want to cut it to a short story, you just have to sort of... Do you think it helps with writing the, real, the really short, like the flash fictions? Yeah. That skill? Yeah. Yeah. 
Two of the short stories in this collection have already been made into short films. How did that come about? A guy named Ruben Field, who's a filmmaker, happened to read the UTS anthology that those two stories, Robber and Gecko, were in. And he initially con contacted me to make a film because he wanted to make a film out of Robber because he had won this award from MTV to make a one-hour film. And he thought Robber would be a kind of a good warm-up because it had a similar feel. But then MTV said, you know, you can't make that film. We're giving you this money. So that fell through. And then a few years went by, and when, then he contacted me and said, I still want to make Robber, but now I want to make Gecko because that kind of fit this Metro Screen funding thing. So we turned it into a script, and then we didn't get the Metro Screen funding thing, but we still made it. And then he made Robber as well at the same time. And what was it like to see your stories depicted on the screen? It's very cool. Yeah. Very, very cool. Especially Robber, because that, not the actual action that happens in it, but the setting is very much of a time in my life. And so he told me this address in Erskineville where they were filming, and I walked into this house, and it was just like walking back to 1994, oh. Austin, Texas, <laughs> with just like beer cans and cigarette butts and bongs all over the table, and it was really weird and cool. Yeah, doing the props must have been interesting <laughs> for the filming. Yeah, they, they made a gelatinous glass ashtray because someone has to get smashed yeah. in the face. Wow. Yeah. And there was like this crumpled up chip bag that was like taped <laughs> to the floor and after every take they'd be like, put the chip bag back. <laughs> what responsibility do you have to your character to depict their change along their journey? When I was at uni doing film, we had this teacher, Ken Robinson, who was this kind of old Hollywood guy and I would submit these screenplays with very passive characters. So all, for some reason, I just would write these screenplays where there was just, you know, there's this girl and she has to buy cat food and she's walking around the city and all these weird people are doing things and then she just goes home and doesn't even get cat food. And he hated them. <laughs> and I was so frustrated. I was like, don't you see how awesome this movie would be? And he'd be like, your character doesn't change. They don't do anything. Why should I care about this person? And now I realize how right he was. But at the time, I was very frustrated. So. I think the, main, the most important thing when someone's reading a story is for them to feel like, I want to know what's going to happen. I care about this character. But it's one of those things where like, once you learn the rules, you can then break them. So I think I'm now trying to just break those rules by maybe showing someone not changing, but, in, but trying to make it so that the reader is kind of hoping they will, or, or at least you know, engaged emotionally somehow. I'm glad you said that. Like I'd been meaning to trot out the phrase, learn the rules before you break the rules for a while. Because um, when these pieces came to me, they were like of a very high standard already. And I could see that, you know, John had obviously worked very, very hard on them. So I think there's a lot to be said for learning the rules before you break the rules. and not being the kind of person who says, no, I don't read other writers because, you know, it will affect my purity as a writer. I, I have had students who say that and I'm sort of like, well, if you want to be a writer, the thing you need to do is read. There, I think there are a surprising amount of, you know, aspiring writers who don't particularly like to read. When you first saw these stories, did you see them as a collection? Like, I loved each story individually as I read them. And I... Don't, I mean, I am happy with a very, like, a loose collection of stories also. Like, so being a poet, uh, you know, I'm used to seeing collections of things that are quite, quite different, mm. like big range. I mean, I actually think it's great for a writer to be able to kind of showcase this scope that they have and, you know, dexterity with, with different styles. Um, but... I think what I found was, um, you know, the, the thing that you sort of picked up on about the, the positions of people in these, in these stories, being at a kind of tipping point or whatever, that was definitely there. And what was also there for me was this very present tone throughout the book that for me really held it together. So I don't know if that comes from, you know, editing as a poet, a sort of voice. And, and I, I know, you know, there were times when it was a character's voice or it was sort of John's voice or at times John's voice was more present than not. But um, the stories are 
very divergent, but they're somehow told in quite similar ways, I think, in the flow of language. And, um, and, and so, you know, I, I was really amazed in the way it moved from sort of um, stuff like turtle, you know, with sticking the cotton wool balls <laughs> onto the fridge in the box to something like um, Jungle Train. Like, I think Jungle Train is sort of real tour de force in, like, realist storytelling. It still has that tipping point. And I guess the character, Roisin, who gets off the train, you know, um, she has made that choice. It's a, it's a very even tone. It's very modulated, you know, I think if it was music, would have quite gentle phrasing and something I just said to John before is I feel that even though some of the stories you know they verge on the is this real is this not some of them like tooth clearly aren't things that could be real and some of them like uh, like the last Wilkies which I felt sort of touched quite a bit on magic realism they still all have this tone that it's a sort of slice of life for someone somewhere, for, for the character that's involved, no matter how bizarre the circumstances or the situation, you know, they find themselves in. So maybe, you know, it was that for me that sort of held it together. Um, although, you know, I wasn't overly worried about sort of looking for a, a theme, but it somehow, even without me thinking about one, it just seemed to hang together really well. I spent a lot of time working out the order of the stories because of that, because of my worry that the collection wouldn't really hold together. And I thought, you know, should I separate all the short, funny ones into one section? Should I, let, you know, have different sections? But what I ended up doing was trying to go from kind of young characters who are sort of like, where do I belong? Like robber or unpacking through to sort of young adult, you know, looking at like open for inspection where they're looking for a house to buy through to sort of grown ups like the last Wilkies. And then I tried to pair a short story with a longer story. So it kind of alternates so have these kind of little couples of stories. Is there a part of you that likes to leave the reader hanging? I think it's just a really effective, you know, an ending that takes a long time and kind of winds down. I don't know if it ever works, but it certainly works maybe in a novel, but in a short story, I think the short ending, like, um, so there's a Raymond Carver story, which is called The Bath, which is about um, a, cup, a woman goes to order a birthday cake for her son, Scotty. And then the day before his birthday, he gets hit by a car and he's in the hospital. So the husband and wife are in the hospital, you know, by the kid's bedside for two days. And finally, the husband says, look, nothing's changing here. You should go home and have a bath. So she goes home and she's sitting in the bath and the phone rings. So she runs out and gets the phone. And she's like, hello, hello, is this about Scotty? And the voice on the other end says, Scotty, yeah, this is about Scotty. And then it just leaves you there. And you know, what you kind of infer is that's, it's the, not the hospital, it's the baker because they never picked up the birthday cake. And that just like, I think is so, so good. The interesting thing is then Raymond Carver had a heart attack that almost killed him. And then he rewrote that story and called it a small good thing and in A Small Good Thing, there's this whole long ending where the kid dies and then they go to the bakery and they're like, you were terrible to call us. And the baker's this sad alcoholic who's like, I didn't realize what was happening. Come in, come in, have some fresh bread. Eating is a small good thing at a time like this, yeah. you know, which is a nice ending. But I think, the, you know, he went a little soft after that heart attack. Right. Yeah, well, I mean, that, I think that was when he stopped working so closely with Gordon Lish, wasn't he? And, and yeah. He also, he said, you know, he felt like all his years after the heart attack were a gift and he, I guess he got all kind of touchy-feely. But yeah, with Gordon Lish. So there's another story by him which is called One More Thing. And in that story, it's this guy having an argument with his wife and he's about to leave and he's packed all his suitcases and then he puts down his suitcase and he says, I just have one more thing to say. But then he couldn't possibly remember, think of what that could be. But actually... The real end, the original ending of that story was a song here. He, he wanted to say how much he loved her. He wanted to say, it's just like five paragraphs of just rambling. And Gordon Lish just cut all of that and just made it, but he couldn't think of what it could possibly be, which is such a great ending. But then, yeah, that's an interesting, you know, you didn't do anything like that to me. <laughs> you wouldn't let me. 
Well, I wonder how the conversation between those, you know, Raymond Carver must have been like, whoa, you just cut the whole last page of my story. But actually, that is damn good. I wonder. I tried to remove one line, and <laughs> you weren't having any of it. Which line did you try to remove? Ah, uh, from the end of Jungle Train. And I think it was, um, you know, she gets off the train and she opens up the banana leaf and it is something delicious. And then I think that the very final line was, well, no matter what happened now, at least she had plenty of food. Yeah. And just leave it at, she'd unwrapped the delicious banana leaf full of sort of rice and nuts. We had a bit of a discussion about that, but um, yeah. Well, and I think spineless, Spineless's policy, you know, is that the author gets final say as well. So, um, but like I said, you know, the pieces all came so polished. I think, I think in some ways I was like maybe what you'd call not in a political sense, the tone police, but like in a, in a flow or a sort of poetic sense. And um, I was really obsessed with which stories were set in America or Australia. I kept asking John, and he'd be like, neither, it could be anywhere. It's a, a place. Some of these are very Australian stories, while others seem quite American to me. Could you tell me more about the role of place within your work? Yeah, it's funny, the last Wilkies, everyone insists that's in America. Yeah. Of course it is. <laughs> well, I didn't, I never think of it as being in America. But that's the weird thing when you're from another country, you sort of don't quite, it's taken me a lot, I guess, like a good 15 years of being in Australia to kind of make peace with that, I guess. Yeah. When I first moved, so when I was at UTS doing these screenwriting classes, I work in the archives at the ABC, in the film archives, so I was watching a lot of 70s Australian television, and I guess the ABC was like, we really have to portray Australian culture on screen, <laughs> so they had a lot of characters who were like, to right, mate, eh, uh, cabba. And so I was writing characters like that, in my, and everyone in my class would be like, Australians don't talk like this. What is wrong with you? And I was like, I thought they did. It's what, it's what I'm saying. Yeah, funny. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so now I'm just sort of, and, and this, I don't know, maybe it sounds kind of stupid, but like when you're American, it's like I'm not different enough to really, you know, if I was from Sri Lanka, I could be like writing about, you know, in the Sri Lankan culture and like what the, what the experience of Sri Lankans in Australia is. But who is that interested in the experience of Americans in Australia? It's not really exotic enough or something. Do you consider yourself an Australian writer? A hybrid, I guess. I mean, I can't. So that's the thing. Like, The Last Wilkies, I wasn't writing it thinking, like, oh, this must be in America. But I guess that came through. I mean, I guess it's less plausible that there'd be this forgotten, you know, fast food franchise in some weird mountain town. You know, it does seem very much more like West Virginia than, but, you know, like some people have said, well, it could be Lithgow. And you, you do have those smaller kind of fast food chains in yeah. America, I it's think, just a like lot more, dotted, yeah. like m whereas here we've only really got the big ones that we've imported from America. Um, and like, you know, Wilkie's doesn't feel that big. Yeah, so I guess there's that, the American comes through, I guess. So I wouldn't say, you know, like, no, I'm Australian. And that's, I think what I learned was I can't, I have to not try to be Australian. So that's what I was doing for, I was like, I'm going to try to just be an Australian and this did, didn't work. I was kind of overthinking it and not natural. Even just, even just like um, seeding your stories with sort of nouns, like, you know, Julie Chevalier, who also publishes through Spineless, she does differentiate between her Australian and her American work, but it will often sort of be, you know, you have to choose, do you put the car or do you put the Commodore or do you put the Pontiac? Mm. You know, and, and those kind of little things help, I guess, if you... But it seems to be a part of your writing, I think, that you like the setting to be a bit amb ambiguous. Yeah. Sometimes, I mean, you know, if you know where it's set, if it's in your head, yeah. then, sure, put the Pontiac or the Commodore. But if you want it to be ambiguous, then just say, you know, put the late model sedan, four door, automatic transmission of some description and leave it ambiguous, I guess. And that's, yeah, why I wanted Last Walkies especially to be kind of ambiguous. So John, I'd like to discuss some of the individual pieces, starting with Fleas, where you have an ending that's so flippant and ominous. How did you arrive at that conclusion? I was interested in the idea of just this mundane, banal afternoon being broken by this unspeakably horrific thing happening. 
and what, how the character would react. And I guess I just imagined that he would just go into total denial and just like, you know, you have these close calls and then you go home and you're just like, wow, that was, we almost died on the road today or whatever. You know, this is a case where it's not a close call, it's an actual horrible terrorist attack happening at Ikea. But in his head, he's still like, no, no, we'll go home and it's all just going to be normal. Like, we'll have to get the fleas out of the, out of the clothing. Isn't that the yes. clothing? Blankets or something. They had to or give the cat the flea treatment because right, right. those damn fleas are so hard to get rid of. Yeah. And he's sort of like imagining all of the like little tchotchkes that you buy at the end at Ikea. Yeah, it's such a chilling last statement. Oh, see, that's another one I tried to... <laughs> you tried to get rid of, really? <laughs> I guess. Really, how come? Um, I just wanted it to end with they'd have oh they had to do had to do the flea treatment. Mm. I didn't want the oh they're hard to get rid of. I don't. I thought it was even more mundane with just even the fleas not being hard to get rid of. Mm. Yeah. yeah. But I probably found that story funnier than I should have because I also really dislike IKEA. I've only been there once and <laughs> yeah. I don't cope. Yeah. <laughs> The weird thing with that story was I wrote it two or three months before the Lint Cafe siege. And when that happened, I was like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> like suddenly my story will seem like it's, I don't know, I guess it doesn't. Like when they pull a show from TV because of insensitive timing. Exactly. Yeah. And in Tooth, there's so much pain and frustration that just leads to nothing. I think of just, I think it's sort of an allegory of just a drunk person coming home and just like crashing around the house yeah. and then just crawling into bed yeah. with someone who's just like, it seemed to me to use elements of magical realism. Yes. Did you think of a drunk person? Not at all. I thought about a sad tragedy. I thought it was more of an uh, existential crisis, maybe sort of very Kafkaesque. In Exposure, there seems to be a relationship between setting and subtext. And what inspired that? That story started as a writing exercise in my writing group. Mm. So the writing exercise was write a story that takes place entirely in the dark. And so I just imagined, and I, I find it interesting how, like a horrible car accident, how immediately you go from like, do to do, it's warm, and we're zipping along the highway listening to music to just like, everything is completely, I guess it's a bit like fleas, it's just sort of like the banal, regular day-to-day -day thing is just interrupted by this horrible, so I, that's kind of how it started, was just imagining that scenario of two people upside down in a ravine in a crashed car, yeah. and then I wondered, you know, okay, what sort of, relationship and drama can unfold between those two people. And I have to admit, like the first time I read the story, I didn't actually get the relationship. Um, I, like I knew it was a young boy and I just assumed she'd been letting him drive her car when he shouldn't have been or something like that. Like I didn't kind of pick up on any hint of, you know, goings on between them and, until I reread it a couple more times. and. Um, I love the way it was actually quite banal in the car as well. You know, she's just sort of like, well, uh, my arm's broken and you know, no, that's just blood from my head. And the teenager's just whining about what to do about this situation. So like, even though you had this very intense, dramatic space, what's happening within it is really strange. So Bronwyn told me, oh, I found someone to edit your book. Her name is Josh Dubrow. And I thought, okay, someone's going to edit my book. But then I did a bit of internet stalking. And I was like, oh, she played in the Heaps Goods, which was this Wollongong punk band that my band had played with at this gig a year earlier. And so basically, and she had all these friends in common. Yeah, and I was like, oh, okay. I think we're going to get along just fine. Mm. Yeah. And did you? Oh, yeah, we get yeah, really well. And um, John's wife used to work in Wollongong. So, and I still live in Wollongong, so, um, yeah, I think we know people in common, and um, I think we're sort of of an age and of a type a bit. I remember, like, when I was reading Robbers, I was just like, oh, wow, I'm back in my share house in Cleveland Street. It's, like, 1994, you know. There was just, like, a lot of stuff I identified with. Um, the editing process was very very friendly. Um, I often do academic editing, which is where people just expect you to like fix everything and send it back to them. But this was sort of like, you know, I'd do chunks using track changes. We'd meet up here, have a chat about it, you know, and I would say why I thought something should 
be changed or ask questions about whether this was the, you know, whether this word meant what John thought it meant. And then he'd kind of, I guess it was a bit like doing a uh, dissertation defense for you, wasn't it? But you also <laughs> pointed out, you found a lot of, you'd say, did you realize that you just repeated this word three times in yeah. one paragraph? And I go, oh, no, I didn't. So, yeah. yeah. It's like subtle things, but that makes such a huge. Stuff like that. And um, just, you know, I did. I, like, I questioned a lot of John's word choices and stuff, but often because I wasn't sure where he was going with them. Um, prob probably I'd say that on the whole, like it, it was for me difficult throughout. Like I, like I said this before, I definitely wanted a lot of the things to feel more nailed down in terms of place, in terms of, you know, um, exactly what was going on. Like John is obviously more comfortable with that kind of ambiguity than I am, I think. Um, but, you know, it was, I, I think it was a fairly painless process on I the whole. quite enjoyable. Do you remember the first time we met here? Yeah. There was some, like, was it State of Origin or something? Yeah. There was this huge screen in <laughs> what here. He was on. And we were hunkered down in this booth <laughs> with your laptop. Yeah. With, like, these roars <laughs> of people, like, ah, every time some goal was scored or whatever. Yeah. That was really fun. Yeah. It, was, it, it was really good. And, um, like, yeah, it was a great experience to sort of um you know i this is actually the first full book that i'd edited i've done sort of stuff bits of stuff for anthologies or you know stuff like that before but like to kind of get just to get to talk to someone about their whole creative process as you go through it as well um and i think i'm pretty amazed at like how invested i feel in, in the book now like yeah. I mean, I was really lucky to get someone who understood who I was really comfortable talking to and who understood mm. what I was getting at and, you know, liked the book. Yeah. I think that's maybe the most important thing you can do is try and make sure you know where the writer's coming from. So thanks so much, John and Josh, for speaking with me this evening about The Last World Gears and other stories. I'm Emma Rose Smith and I've been speaking with John Steiner and Joshua DeBrow. Good night.